He is indeed great, isn't he? In fact, great just feels not even great enough to describe how great he truly is. I don't know about you, I've, I've really, I know the transitions aren't always uh, spotless, but I really have enjoyed hearing so many different people from our church reading scripture and praying and being involved in the service. It just warms this pastor's heart. I know that's not for everybody, so don't worry. It's not mandatory, um, but uh, I, I, it's been an encouragement, I think, to see so many people involved in the service. I really have enjoyed that. I know you've been longing for this moment to return back to 2 Samuel, but uh, we are ready to do that now. So please join me as we return to 2 Samuel 6. This has been an interesting week. Uh, this is a weird place to pick up from after taking a break, but I'm excited about this morning. We're going to be finishing chapter 6, starting in verse 16. Uh, and if you're new to Gray Gables, part of the reason that we're about to stand for the honor of reading God's Word is to distinguish between what is happening right now in the reading of God's Word and what will follow in the preaching of God's Word. See, what I'm about to read is infallible and inerrant. The preaching, on the other hand, it, it, it's not. Now, we hope and trust in the power of the work of the Spirit that what will be preached will be true as long as it's in accordance with what we read, certainly, that the Lord will use it for the edification of the saints. But I think it's right and good to make a distinction between the two. We are about to read the sufficient, infallible, inerrant Word of God. So would you stand with me for the honor of doing that together in 2 Samuel chapter 6, starting in verse 16, reading to the end of the chapter. This is what God's Word says. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his own house. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, It was before the Lord, who chose me instead of your father and all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. First Baptist Church of Grey Gables, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures Let's go to the Lord and thank him for his word. Gracious Father, you have already been so kind to us this morning in just bringing us here and allowing us to wake another day of giving us air to breathe, shelter, food, placing us, Lord, in these relationships with these people that support us and encourage us, drawing us here into this place where we um, get to hear the good news of your son as it's been sung already and prayed and taught in Sunday school. We've, we've read it and now we seek to preach it. Would you help me to do so boldly that, um, Lord, you would honor your word. And, and I pray for, Lord, these people that you would give them focus. This is a labor of a text this morning. Help us to participate and, and work hard in listening well and engaging. And I pray by your spirit Lord, that your word would be impressed upon us in such a way that we would be transformed more and more into the image of our King Jesus. We trust you for the outcome, and we pray this all in his blessed name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Well, I want to remind us that, that where we are in the book is really at the summit, the, the peak of the book of Samuel as we consider it as a whole. 
As we consider that narrative, what we've seen so far is uh, the resolution to the conflict that's not just evident here in Samuel, but the, the problem, the conflict that started all the way back in the book of Genesis. Now David has been made king and his kingdom has been established. God's people being blessed because of that, because of their king. And now this section continues to unpack that in significant ways. Uh, David most recently has been successful in bringing the ark of the Lord into the city of David. And so God will come now to dwell among his people in a way that he really hasn't for quite some time. But as is our custom, because it's been a while, you'll see in your outline, we're going to start in the broader context and move our way to the nearer context. And then finally, we will get to our text. Um, the broader context was where we start. And let me start by saying this to help us really understand this text. Because reading it, you're probably at this point saying, where in the world are we going with this? Let me start by saying this. One could say that the entire redemptive narrative, the entire story of the Bible is about knowing the right man. You could say the entire redemptive narrative is about knowing the right man or being rightly related to the right man that our relationship with God might be restored. As we consider that in our day and age, that does actually make the Bible hopelessly politically incorrect. I hope you know that. It's about a very specific man and every other person on the planet either being rightly related to that man or at enmity with God based on his or her relationship with that man. Now, throughout the course of redemptive history, follow this, the man changes and doesn't change. Make sense? Pay attention. Every man that precedes the man is actually just a type of the man. That's going to make perfect sense in about three hours, okay? Just let it, let it sit here. In fact, if we start at the very beginning, this story is about a guy who listens to his wife instead of the Lord and brings ruin upon humanity. This is the conflict that's introduced at the beginning of the story. Adam was originally the man, but he disobeyed the Lord. He stretched out his hand, taking what the Lord had prohibited, and now... From that point forward, it's actually a story about a woman, oddly enough, and her seed. But, but this is my point. Uh, the seed is a new man who will succeed where his father Adam failed and remove the shame of his family name. Uh, this male seed of the woman will obey his Lord and replace the ruin with reward. So again, my, my, my point is, every passage and verse fits into that narrative somehow. For example, take the book of Genesis. Genesis is pretty much about the patriarchs, isn't it? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And in a less obvious way, but more significant way, it's about Judah. For the most part, everyone else in the book of Genesis is a supporting character. What about Exodus? Exodus is about Israel, whose corporate identity, according to the Lord himself, is the Son of God. It's also about Moses and his mediatorial role as, uh, of, uh, in the redemption of Israel out of Egypt. And so as we trace the storyline, Moses then passes the baton to who? To Joshua. Right? Joshua drops the baton, which is then kind of kicked around by the time we get to the book of Judges. In fact, uh, it, Judges actually reminds me of this uh, video I saw one time of a football play. It was when Louisiana Tech played Mississippi State, and Louisiana was marching in on Mississippi State's seven-yard line, about to go in for a touchdown, uh, when the snap goes over the quarterback's head. And then player after player tries to pick up the ball, and they end up kicking it and kicking kicking it and kicking it all the way back to Louisiana Tech's own six-yard line. So they have third and goal with about 94 yards to go to get a touchdown. That's the book of Judges in a nutshell, by the way. 
And so now, after the book of Judges and after some things in Samuel, David emerges from the, baton, uh, from the pile with the baton securely in his grasp. And now, in our passage, all eyes are on him. Blessing and curse, forgiveness and wrath, salvation and death are tied up with how one either honors or dishonors this man. In fact, here's another thing I want you to know in the broader context. Acknowledging the man is the man matters more than anything else. Hear this. Acknowledging that the man is the man matters more than anything else. What matters in the end is one's relation to the man. It determines one's eternal destiny. If I was trying to convince you of the importance of this passage that we just read, it would be just that. This passage helps us identify the right man. Because there are a lot of imposters. A lot. In fact, if you miss it, then what happens is you will inevitably distort every other part of the story. There has only ever been one way for salvation. You know that, right? From the garden onward, it has always been by faith alone, by God's grace alone, in the Messiah alone, or in the man alone. But Pastor Cody, that's not possible because the Messiah doesn't really come onto the scene until the book of Matthew, right? Wrong. Because the Messiah is actually in the garden. He's the eternal Son of God who is present in the garden. But more importantly, for our purposes, in the Old Testament... The man comes as the promise. You really need to know that. And we have questions all the time. I feel these questions. How are people saved in the Old Testament? Here's how. Uh, see this. In the Old Testament, the man, the one we're longing for, the seed of the woman who's going to come and destroy the head of the serpent, always comes as the promise. The promise of the seed of the woman is the grounds for salvation. One's faith is the means by which one is made right with God from Genesis 3.15 onward. Now what's important is that there are various types or shadows or pictures of the seed. Uh, one example really quickly is Abraham. We, we, we know Genesis 1-11 through 11 kind of sets up everything. There, there's sin, it's spreading, it's corrupting everything. So humanity has just been cursed again after the flood. They've been cursed again at Babel in Genesis 11. There's disunity, discord, followed by Genesis chapter 12, which brings about this precious calling and promise. It's the call of Abraham. Most are familiar with it, but I want you to hear this from the word of the Lord. Get this. Genesis chapter 12 Verses 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, it's before the name change, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. So, so Abram's called out to a land. The Lord's going to show him. He's going to be blessed. His name's going to be great. But he's also going to be a conduit for a blessing to all the nations. So more significantly, though, his seed is going to be that. Let's continue. This is critical to get in, 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 chapter, in verse 3 of chapter 12. Look at it. It says, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So how will that blessing come? Those who actually are rightly related to Abraham will be rightly related to God. And we actually see that play out in the life of Abraham. In fact, we see that play out in so many types and shadows that it began to be a sermon on its own, and I had to cut it out of this one. So I'm going to skip way from there and follow this same thread to now our nearer context. When we get to the book of 1 Samuel, which is the nearer context, here's what we find in the nearer context as 1 Samuel begins. There is no... The man. So everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. Okay? You follow me so far? There is no the man, so everyone does what is right in their own eyes. I want us to pick up at the very beginning of 1 Samuel and kind of think about how it opens. There's no the man. In fact, 
the issue is the lack of the man. It's, it's directly tied to the rarity or scarcity of God's word. So everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. I want you to think about that. And secondly, keep in mind that over the nearer context of First and Second Samuel, there's this ark motif. At the beginning of First Samuel, remember what happens. The ark disappears from the scene. Which means, therefore, God's dwelling presence has, has kind of moved to the back of the stage. And yet, what did we just read? David is the one who has brought the ark back in the midst of God's people. He has become the man. So you honor David and you will be honored. If you curse David, you will be cursed. Uh, th that problem clearly presented in the book of Judges and the opening chapter of 1 Samuel is here resolved as lowly David is exalted. His name becomes greater than every other name and the baton of blessing is carried forward. So Samuel opened with the problem of having no man. But then the arg motif reminds us as David has brought that back, the presence of God is brought back through the man and now we know that David is the one who is depicted as the man. David is depicted as the man. In fact, let me consider in specific ways how David is depicted as the man in 1 and 2 Samuel 1. This is our 1 and 2 Samuel. We've kind of recapped this, have gone over this as we've studied this line by line. And remember, the reason why we need to do this, by the way, uh, is because a large part of the way this is meant to work is not for you to hear the Old Testament preached and consider these characters and say, well, how can I be a better person by being like David? Or, or how can I be a better person by not being like McCall? It, now, it's not technically wrong to do that. But there's a more significant and more important function of the text. As it points us to the man, King Jesus, who will finally bring about our reconciliation to the God from whom we were estranged. That's the most important function of the text. That's its primary function. So we need to understand in what ways David is a shadow or type of the man. The first should be fairly obvious if you're familiar with the story thus far. The first is David refused to put out his hand and take what the Lord had not given. David refused to put out his hand and take what the Lord had not given. Again, it takes us all the way back to the garden, doesn't it? But consider it in the life of David. He had plenty of opportunity to, king, to kill King Saul, but he did not reach out his hand against the Lord's anointed. Even though he had opportunity aplenty. He did not reach out and take the kingdom by force. Instead, what did he do? He waited upon the Lord. David did not take vengeance into his own hand, but he trusted himself to the one who judges justly, and the Lord avenged him. So David has up to this point passed that obedience test, so to speak, in a typological way. Second, and closely related to the first... We also think that David's the man here because David inquires of the Lord. We've seen that over and over again, hasn't we? Haven't we? He's the one who seeks the Lord. In fact, we've, we've said that David is at his best when he's acquiring of the Lord and he does so often. But of course, he doesn't just inquire of the Lord as so many of us do. He actually hears and obeys. He is in this sense the anti-Saul. David doesn't simply act based on what his eyes see. David seeks to know what is right in the eyes of the Lord. David is in a way causing God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So David did not take out his hand, reach out his hand and take what the Lord had not given. David inquires of the Lord. Thirdly, this brings us back to our passage finally. David has been rejected and lowly. Over and over again, we've seen this, in, particularly in 1 Samuel, now even here. He has largely been despised and rejected, like his Lord. Remember, the Lord was the one who was initially despised and rejected in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the people desired a king like the king of the nations instead of the king they had in front of them, their God. Israel rejected, despised, and dishonored the Lord. In this sense, David is the man because he looks like his Lord. The whole humility to exaltation motif, it's just central to First and Second Samuel. All right, so that was the introduction. We ready to get to the text? <laughs> All right, now we're on to chapter 6, verses 16 to 23. Our text. What is it do we find in this story? 
we find this. The lowest will be highest, and it's dependent on your relationship to the man. In fact, we, we have to be honest, McCall is in this text the antagonist. And, and I say that because not all commentators actually agree on that, but, but most do. And, and let me say, when we're, we're reading the Old Testament, it's not actually common to psychologize and think about what McCall's, McCall's motives are. Uh, we know the story of McCall, right? We, we ask, was she still angry because David took her away from her husband? Maybe David wasn't kind to her. Was David being malicious toward her? Did she have good reason in her heart to despise David? There are all kinds of conversations that, that revolve around that. But if that's the focus of your mind right now, just toss it out. Here's why. Because far more important than trying to get inside the head of McCall is reading the literary cues and devices used by the author that clearly communicate what we are supposed to focus on. And so we ask, why is McCall the antagonist here? Well, her crime was singular. The dishonoring of David. That was her crime. Why is McCall the antagonist? Because of the dishonoring of David. One, it clearly says in the text that she despised David in her heart. That is just a straightforward, grammatical reading of the text. Also, the description of McCall's location when she sees David, get this, it, it may not seem important. We would read over that in verse 16 and say, what's the big deal of her looking out the window? That can't mean something. She saw King David leaping and dancing. She was in the window as she did. But it's significant that the author records where she was. Why? Why? Because interestingly enough, McCall joins two other women who looked out their window in significant points in redemptive history. You want to know who they are? They just happen to be Sisera's mother in Judges 5 and Jezebel in 2 Kings 9.30. In fact, the exact same Hebrew phrase is used in all three instances. If I was grouped with a few people, by the way, in the scriptures, I would not want it to be Sisera's mother and Jezebel. Uh, but more importantly, though, her despising David in her heart, it's a clear indication of her position. In fact, did you notice that when she rejects David and speaks against him, David is attempting to bless his own household. She impedes David's attempt to bless his household. McCall clearly intercepts David as he's just, received, bless, uh, just blessed all of these people and is headed to bless his own household. She intercepts him and, and reviles him for what she interprets as unbecoming behavior for a king. Don't miss this. A passage that begins with blessing ends with curse in the form of barrenness until the day of death. David blesses Israel and then he moves to bless his house, but instead the narrative ends with a curse of barrenness falling upon the one who cursed David. So actually, if you think about 1 Samuel chapter 1, McCall is portrayed as the anti-Hannah, isn't she? Remember Hannah? You remember Hannah? Her debasement led to exaltation, receiving the seed that she cried out for in her barrenness. McCall's lofty position from her window leads to her debasement and she remains barren until the day of her death. You following? You see it come together? Those literary cues are far more important than the motives that we just can't know. All right, so now at this point, unless you've been sleeping, the reason for this unfortunate destiny of McCall should be clear. There's only one thing stated clearly by the author, and it's her condemnation, her dishonoring of David. That's it. In fact, her fate would have been utterly different if she had left her window and came down to the party. She should have been leading the female servants of the servants, and they're dancing, singing, and honoring of David. Don't miss the irony here either. You know what's really interesting? McCall's not actually wrong. Her, her sarcastic swing at David in verse 20, it's, it's true. She says, how glorious was the king of Israel today. Now, I know none of you wives speak sarcastically to your husbands like that, and I thank you. The statement is dripping with sarcasm, isn't it? What she's really saying is, David, honey, you've made a fool of yourself. 
Look how you stooped, barely dressed, dancing around in the street with a riffraff. McCall's not wrong. David is debasing himself. David is not honoring himself. But why? It's because David is praising and honoring the Lord. He could care less about the approval of men. Think about what precedes that sarcastic response in McCall. You got McCall mentioned as she looks out her window, she disdains or despises David in her heart. And then you have her words to David, but don't miss what takes place in between verse 16 and verse 20. Look at verse 17 with me. So they brought the ark of the Lord. Again, the reason we want to look at the nearer context of 1 Samuel is you really have to read that statement in light of what we know has already transpired. Think about when the ark left the people of Israel. What happened? There was lament, sadness, heartache, despair. That stands in stark contrast to the rejoicing we see among them here. So let's ask another question. We asked why is Michelle McCall the antagonist? Because her crime was dishonoring David. I want to ask another question. Why is there a party going on in the streets? Because the Lord is dwelling among his people. <laughs> That's why there's a party going on. It's because the Lord is dwelling again among his people. Look at what has transpired. And here's the key. This makes McCall's unwillingness to honor David look even more condemnable. The ark has been brought back in. The ark of the Lord has been brought into the tent of David. And that is not a small matter. It means that the Lord is willingly being brought into among his people. Don't miss the picture of God's grace and mercy here towards David and the Israelites. The Lord is indeed with David and for David. In fact, if we're thinking about the grand story, this is one step closer to the restoration and consummation of the Eden project that the Bible's really all about, isn't it? The language in these verses confirm this. We see burnt offerings, peace offerings being offered and received by the Lord. A clear indication that, that God is accepting His people. No fire breaks out and consumes anyone. That's always a good thing in the Old Testament. The Lord is with his people and they are feasting and rejoicing in the presence of their God. What a scene. And you read on, it's not done. David blesses the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. More importantly for our purposes, the people are blessed by the Lord's anointed. So don't forget, you know, we, do you know we have a tendency to think wrongly about the term blessing? It, and it really is. We have to think rightly about this. It's so central to understand what the Lord's doing here. We tend to misuse blessing or blessedness or blessed. So we say things like, have a blessed day. Well, what do we really mean by that? We mean, I hope your day is comfortable and you don't have any problems. But that's not what the Bible actually means when it uses blessing. Did you know that? When, when we think about people being blessed, we tend to think in the physical Man, that guy's blessed. Did you see his car? Did you see his house? He's got this physical blessing. He's healthy and he's happy. But that completely disconnects and undoes what blessing actually means in the Bible itself. Hear this. Blessing is inseparable from the God who blesses. Blessing is being rightly related to him. Those things that we often look to as blessings, they're secondary to a right relationship with God. It is better to have nothing and to have God than to have everything and not have God. So here, David blesses his people. And by that, he's figuratively bringing him into the Lord's presence. That is, he both calls for and proclaims the favor, countenance, and kind disposition of God towards his people. And that blessing is followed by a distribution of, of rich food for all the people in verse 19. I hope you like raisins, right? Notice the emphasis of all the people. It says, the whole multitude, both the men and women, the, the scope of David's provision, it's depicted in, it couldn't be clearer terms, honestly. The coming of the ark into the tent of David has not led to some localized benefit as in the day of Judges, experienced just by a few but, but experienced by everyone. Everyone.
everyone there is blessed. Look at verse 19 again. David says, or the, the Bible says, then he distributed, speaking of David, among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the men and the women, to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And just in case you didn't get it so far, at the end of verse 19, he says, so all the people departed, everyone to his own house. Couldn't be more clear, could it? You want to know what makes that even more beautiful? Uh, the very warning about the king that the people wanted back in 1 Samuel 8. If you go back to, to 1 Samuel 8, the very warning that was given when the people desired to have a king like the king of the nations is the king you want, just know this, he's going to take and take and take and keep on taking. Here is the man of God's own choosing. And, and what is, what is he taking? We see him giving and giving and giving. To who? Everyone. There's even a reference here to all the parting. It says each to his own house. Even the last phrase of verse 19, everyone to his house. It's a reminder that their faithful God has provided for each and every one. By the way, in houses that they did not build, with vineyards that they did not plant, in a land that was not theirs. This after being rejected by them. Friends, this is our God. All of that makes the offense of McCall so much more grievous. And in response to such a great and wonderful moment in redemptive history, what is she doing? She's standing like the Pharisees outside the house of the benevolent father, refusing to attend the party. She will not go in to see the younger brother blessed. Now let's look at one more question here. For David's part, he is despised. We should ask, why? Why is David despised? Well, in verses 20 and 23, the reason she despises him in this instance really comes down to David's conduct. It comes down to what David's doing. David's conduct. David is not acting very kingly. The king of the nations doesn't hang out in the streets with a rabble. Again, McCall's not wrong. David says as much in verses 21 and 22. So David said to McCall, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler of the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord and I will be even more undignified than this. David's first defense is, You're not wrong. I have dishonored myself. It wasn't in the eyes of the servants though, but in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, that was McCall's first error. Like her father Saul, McCall has failed to know the Lord. It's another reason why David's despised, by the way. It's because I think it's safe to say that McCall does not know the Lord. She has yet to see all of life unfolding before the true and living God. And so she's therefore failed to see David's actions in light of what the Lord has done. Instead, what she only sees is the earthly. That which is transpiring right in front of her eyes. She evaluates according to the principles of this world. And had her eyes been on the Lord, McCall again would have been on the street leading the female servants in the praise and thanksgiving that was appropriate for the moment. And so what I love about this is that David continues and essentially goes on and says, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you think it's bad. Wait to see how long I party. <laughs> Wait to see how low I can go in humbling myself. Interestingly enough, this verse begins with the verb that's found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, the one we looked at towards the beginning. And it's translated as cursed there. And given the central motif of blessing and cursing based on whether one blesses or curses the Lord's anointed, that verb choice would seem significant. Either way, what we see here is David does not return reviling for reviling. Instead, David declares he's going to be made even lower. And yet... He'll still be honored by those who are lowly and despised. That's a gospel word, by the way. Do you see it yet? You connecting it to the gospel? Here's the main reason why David's despised. It's because David points us to the real man. The real man. Take up this passage and, and, and put this passage on like a pair of glasses. And then move to the New Testament and see what you see. When you get to the New Testament, what do you find? Actually, we find the same condition we saw at the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel. 
The narrative opens in Matthew with Israel separated from God. And the ark is where? They don't even know. It's gone. There's a temple there, sure, but has the Lord ever filled it? No. So Israel has been existing in a state of lamenting for hundreds of years. And then David's greater son appears on the scene. He brings the presence of God back to God's people. Not in an ark placed in a tent, but in his own flesh. The Lord once again comes and he tabernacles and dwells with his people. And what's the result? Kind of like verses 17 through 19. He brings the presence of God back to his people. And there's fellowship between God and his people. The word of blessing is spoken to God's people. The provision of health, food, and forgiveness are generously provided for all who come to the son of David. But there are also McCall's, are there not? There are those who despise the magnitude of the redemptive moment. They despise the son of David in their hearts. They look from their window down on Jesus as he mingles with the servant's servants. Worse, because the greater son of David actually associates with sinners. I mean, real vulgar fellas. He eats with them, talks with them, is honored by them as though that was a good thing. And the McCall's in the New Testament, they are indignant. See, they're looking for a king who acts like a king. Who dresses like a king, walks like a king, talks like a king. But this son of David was not clothed in majesty, nor was there anything stately and kingly in his appearance that we should be attracted to him. Even when he explained that what he did, he did before his father and not before the eyes of men. Even then he was despised. He wasn't trying to make friends and influence people. The son of David was debasing himself because it was for that reason that he came. To give his life as a ransom for many. And so the son of David would tell his disciples, I will become even more undignified than this. And when his disciples go to him and say, Jesus, you realize you're offending the Pharisees. He says, you ain't seen nothing yet. He would willingly allow his enemies to hold him in the lowest esteem possible. Think his life even not worth sparing. Friends, listen, no one has ever gone so low. No one has ever moved from such an exalted position as the eternal son of God who uncovered himself of his divine prerogative in order to clothe himself with human frailty. All that so he might be made even more undignified still, despised and rejected by men. It was the will of his father to crush him and he tasted death for us all so that we might be lifted from our lowly estate to know the glory of the sons and daughters of the king most high. So how do we apply this? What do we do with a weird text like this? The application is simple. Honor or dishonor, it's your choice. You can honor the man or dishonor the man. Like, listen, it, it's been clearly proclaimed here now to each and every person in this room, hasn't it? There is only one thing that matters. You either honor him or you, in the end, will be dishonored. You either bless him or pronounce on yourself the very curse you desire to fall on him. You, you stay in your window, look down your nose at the son of David, or you climb off your high horse, come down to the street and partay. Like really, that's all that's left. First, you have a choice, but second, let me just say, if you've honored the son, it's time to party. <laughs> Hear me, listen, it's okay. We can do that now. You know, I, I know we're not home yet. Yes, we're, we're making our way into that promised reality when Christ returns and makes all things new. But friends, in light of the certainty of the final consummation of what Christ has already initiated, what is left but rejoicing, giving thanks, and parting? Really, it's okay. I mean, honestly... If we can celebrate a new year with fireworks and parties and feasting, when the years just keep getting worse, by the way. Have you noticed that? 
What are we celebrating? <laughs> We're celebrating the demise of civilization as we know it? What are we, honestly, if we can do that, then why can't we party in here? Celebrate good times. Come on. You didn't think I was going to quote that, did you? <laughs> if you know me, you should have. <laughs> Friends, the choice is clear. We're going to continue to party. Do you know that? I mean, think about how we view church, how we view the certainty of our salvation in light of this text. This is a joyous celebration. Every Sunday, it's a joyous celebration. So listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue the party this morning. We're about to pray. Then we're going to respond with rejoice and thanksgiving and song. Then we're going to feast with the Lord's Supper. Then we're going to conclude this service and we'll continue to party as we fellowship with one another after the service. As we gather for lunch, we are going to celebrate Jesus Christ. I mean, listen, as bad as things may be, wherever you are, whatever your trials, whatever doubts and temptations you face, you have everything you need today to rejoice and give thanks and party. Let's do it together. Would you stand as we pray together? Gracious Father, forgive us just for our dispositions. They're sour, often. They really are. We carry ourselves in, in a way of displeasure and discontent. Forgive us for our grumbling, for our complaining. Forgive us of how soon we forget that we have the Son that we are co-heirs with him, that every spiritual blessing is ours through faith in him. Father, forgive us for losing sight of that and help us revive in us a renewed heart and a renewed desire to honor you with lips that praise his name, to honor you, our Father, by honoring him, your Son. Father, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.